Section twenty two of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England. Oh, she has an iron will, an axe like edge, unturnable, our head, the princess. Tennyson. Here vanity assumes her pert grimace. Goldsmith. Elizabeth of England is a heroine of history, not as a crowned and vain woman, but as one who in early life captivated all hearts by her youthful graces and acquirements sustained many trials with fortitude, and escaped repeated dangers by her precocious sagacity and self-command. To her own wisdom, more than to any other mortal means, she owed her preservation, her popularity, and firm establishment on the throne of England. Her subsequent course presents little to be admired. Lord Bacon has been called the wisest, brightest, meanest of mankind, Elizabeth, in whose reign Bacon flourished, may be called the wisest, brightest, and meanest of women, if her reputation for extraordinary intellect is to be trusted as readily as the evidences of her odious character. That she was shrewd, learned, and energetic cannot be doubted, but it is hard to decide how far any ruler should be credited with measures in the suggesting or perfecting of which the wisest counsellors of a nation always participate. If the truth were fully known, many monarchs and presidents would lose the praise of glorious acts, and to some degree the blame of wrongs and follies into which they were entrapped. Elizabeth had a discernment to select able men as her advisers and agents, and the constancy to retain them in office during her long administration. She was fortunate in ascending the throne when the invention of printing, the discovery of America, and the Reformation had just aroused human intellect to new life, and produced great men in every department of literature and enterprise. Bacon, Shakespeare, Spencer, Raleigh, Sidney, and Drake, and other names of like lustre, made the Elizabethan age glorious not the selfish woman from whom the period borrows its title. Her favourites, not herself, were the patrons of genius. In her lifetime England entered on its present career of national grandeur, and achieved the peaceful and magnificent triumphs of art and commerce. But other motives actuated her than enlarged and generous ones. She established the Reformation and founded the English Church, but it was due to her resentment rather than to any enlightened and free spirit. Like the heroine of a novel, she gave her period a name and had the most prominent position in its scenes. The subordinate characters were the real heroes. She was an eagle, as one who most visibly hovered over the sunrise of modern intelligence, but in remorseless spirit, as in lean-necked ugliness, she was a vulture, and in absurd vanity, as in the full-sailed finery of her ludicrous dress, she was a peacock. She was born September the 7th, 1533, at Greenwich Palace, a little below London, on the Thames, now the site of the Greenwich Hospital for disabled or superannuated men of the British Navy. The royal birth occurred in a room called the Chamber of Virgins, and, as further coincidences, it is noticed by a superstitious writer of the time that she was born on the eve of the Virgin Mary's nativity, and died on the eve of her Annunciation. A solemn Te Deum celebrated her advent. Her mother was Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII and famous for her beauty and cruel death. King Henry, the bluff King Harry, was in some respects the fit father of Elizabeth. He had six wives, 
four of whom were either divorced or beheaded to make way for their successors. He was a man of corpulent person, brave, frank, and susceptible of strong, transient attachments, but prodigal, capricious, rapacious, and overbearing in spirit. He once threatened a leading member of Parliament with the loss of his head if he did not secure the passage of a certain bill. His reign was a scene of bloodshed, and nearly all crimes are imputed to him. He divorced his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, mother of the one called Bloody Mary, to make room for Anne Boleyn, and when Elizabeth was in her third year, he brought Anne to the block by an unsupported charge of secret amour, in order that he might marry Jane Seymour, mother of Edward the Sixth, and, like her predecessor, first a maid of honour in the royal household. The christening of Elizabeth on the fourth day of her life was very gorgeous. The Lord Mayor and civic authorities of London, together with a great array of nobility, were present at Greenwich to assist at the ceremonial, which took place at the neighbouring church of Greyfriars, whereof no stone is now left. The procession marched from the palace in the inverse order of rank, citizens and esquires proceeding first. After them went the aldermen, and then lords and ladies, carrying gilt-covered basins, wax tapers, salt, and the jewelled chrism, a cloth to be laid on the child's face, and finally the babe in the arms of her great-grandmother, beneath a canopy upheld by noblemen. The infant was robed in purple velvet, with an ermined train borne by earls and countesses. A crowd of bishops and abbots received the precious charge at the church door, and the celebrated Cranmer acted as godfather. After the baptism, a king-at-arms loudly invoked a blessing on the high and mighty Princess of England, Elizabeth. A flourish of trumpets followed, the child was confirmed, and the sponsors presented her with gifts of golden cups and bowls, rich with gems. Thus was the royal babe initiated into the church of him who taught a gospel of lowliness and simplicity, and thus was the symbol of purification applied with all pomp of pride. Elizabeth's state governess was the Duchess Dowager of Norfolk. Her governess in ordinary was Lady Margaret Bryan, who had sustained that office to the Princess Mary also, and the mansion and costly furniture, together with eleven attendants, were appointed for her infantile years. King Henry would not endure a child's presence at Greenwich. Therefore, when she was three months old, an order of council was issued, with all the solemn folly that attends royalty, to this effect. The King's Highness hath appointed that the Lady Princess Elizabeth shall be taken from hence towards Hatfield upon Wednesday next week, that on Wednesday night she is to lie and repose at the house of the Earl of Rutland at Enfield, and the next day to be conveyed to Hatfield, and there to remain with such household as the King's Highness hath established for the same. In a few weeks, Parliament acknowledged her heiress presumptive to the crown on certain conditions, and disowned her half-sister Mary. Then she was removed to the palace of the Bishop of Winchester at Chelsea. At a proper age, and after a profound deliberation of the great ministers of state on the subject, she was weaned. The official letter authorising this serious step states that the King's Grace, well considering the letter directed to you from my Lady Brian and other my Lady Princess officers, His Grace, with the assent of the Queen's Grace, hath fully determined the weaning of my Lady Princess to be done with all diligence. The King built a palace at Chelsea, where until recently a nursery, bathhouse, and aged mulberry tree were known as Elizabeth's. According to the custom of bargaining away royal hearts and hands even from the cradle, 
it was now time to provide the infant with a future husband. A negotiation was commenced with Francis I of France for her marriage with his third son, the Duke of Angoulême, but the conditions proposed by the English court were so exacting that the affair was broken off, and all further schemes respecting her were arrested by the execution of her mother and the Act of Parliament by which she herself was declared illegitimate and incompetent ever to receive the crown. She was consequently so neglected by the court that not even the means for her comfortable support were furnished to her governess, who at last wrote a lengthy petition to my lord Privy Seal, in which she says that Elizabeth hath neither gown nor kirtle nor petticoat, nor no manner of linen, nor forsmocks nor kerchiefs, nor rails nor body stitchets, nor handkerchiefs nor sleeves, nor mufflers nor biggins. She adds, alluding to the child's slow teething, I trust to God and her teeth were well graft, to have her grace after another fashion than she is yet, so as I trust the King's grace shall have great comfort in her grace, for she is as toward a child, and as gentle of conditions, as ever I knew any in my life. This governess was judicious and faithful and her commendable course, as well as the simple manner of life led by the young princess, doubtless contributed much to the strong qualities afterwards displayed by the latter. Her first appearance in scenes of court was at the christening of her half-brother Edward the Sixth. She was then four years old, and carried the chrism at the ceremony, marching with infant gravity in the procession while the long train of her robe was borne by Lady Herbert, a sister of the woman who became the last wife of King Henry. As a great favour to her, she was made a companion of the young heir. The two became much attached to each other, and on his second birthday, when she was six years old, she gave him a cambric shirt worked by herself. Her precocious intelligence and propriety of demeanour won the good opinion of all visitors and associates, even that of her jealous sister Mary. Both Elizabeth and Edward were fond of study, so much so that, quote, as soon as it was light, they called for their books, end quote. Their first morning hours were devoted to the scriptures and religious exercises. After these came lessons in languages and science, and then, while her brother played in the open air, the princess resorted to her lute, viol, or needlework. When her father was married to Anne of Cleves, his fourth wife, Elizabeth desired to see the new queen, and wrote her a letter remarkable for its good sense, and as being her first known attempt of the kind. Anne was delighted with her sprightly and fair stepdaughter, returned her young affection, and when herself divorced, requested that she might sometimes see the child, declaring that, quote, to have had that young princess for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen, end quote. Her successor, the lovely Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry, and cousin of Anne Boleyn, was equally pleased with Elizabeth, placing her opposite at table and giving her a position nearest herself on great occasions. But it is noticeable that the flattering caresses of so beautiful a woman could not win away the child's preference for Anne of Cleves, so early developed was the characteristic constancy of disposition which was ever one of the few mitigating traits of the relentless maiden queen. Catherine Howard, however, deserved this invidious treatment. She proved to be anything but virtuous, and after her decapitation, the princess lived for the most part with Mary at Havering Bower. In her eleventh year, the king offered her to the son of Arran, a Scottish earl, in order to gain the earl's influence in favour of a contract of marriage between the infant Queen of Scots and young Edward of England. Aaron did not improve the offer, nor, fortunately for Elizabeth, were any similar schemes successful. 
instead of being sent to be educated in foreign courts like mary stuart in fulfilment of such contracts she was happier in enjoying the care of her father's sixth queen the worthy and cultivated catherine parr who had always appreciated her mind and manners and now gave her a room near her own in the palace of whitehall for a child of ten or twelve years old she certainly had made wonderful advances in knowledge with great ease she had mastered the rudiments of all the sciences she wrote and spoke french italian spanish and flemish and was familiar with history to which she set apart three hours every day as if with a secret design already to prepare herself for public life her penmanship was very perfect there was a volume in the whitehall library written by her in french on vellum and in the british museum is a small devotional volume of extracts from various languages selected by catherine parr and translated and penned by elizabeth when twelve years of age the initials of the queen and of the saviour were by her hand worked in blue and silver thread on the cover these acquirements and accomplishments with her graceful behaviour sparkling wit and the kind of beauty that belongs to all childhood gained her many admirers had her destiny been the private domestic circle she might have been generally beloved through life and perhaps have left a name in the annals of intellect but as she grew older her proud station changed her stability to wilfulness her high spirit to violent temper her ambition to vanity and her maiden life made the quote, vinous fermentation of youth turn to the acetous end quote, vinegar of malign envy and jealousy for a time before her father's death elizabeth lived at hatfield house in the town of that name and the hedges of her garden there are still cut in the form of arches as when she sported among them there too her cradle is exhibited from this place she was taken to enfield where in her fourteenth year the death of her father henry the eighth was announced to her and her brother edward who both wept bitterly at their affliction never in the charming words of an old writer was sorrow more sweetly set forth their faces seeming rather to beautify their sorrow than their sorrow to cloud the beauty of their faces edward was ten years old and the splendour of his coronation could not divert his grief at losing the company of his sweetest sister as he called her according to her father's will and by an act of parliament rescinding a former one elizabeth was to succeed to the throne if neither edward nor mary left heirs her income was the same as her sister's over fifty thousand dollars a year so that she was enabled to live in magnificence befitting the sister of the king it was about this time that the lord high admiral seymour made a bold attempt to engage for himself the affections and the hand of elizabeth of whom he had the charge in connection with his wife who had been the last wife of king henry he was uncle to edward and was an immoral and unscrupulous man though accomplished and handsome he had married the widow of henry with an unbecoming haste and before his marriage had made some advances to elizabeth which she firmly rejected a year passed by he still continued his very familiar attentions to her his wife the queen dowager noticed it and sent the young princess away and soon after seymour was in mourning for his wife whom it was suspected he poisoned immediately he renewed his addresses to elizabeth he took care to find out the value of her estates and he gained over to his interest mrs ashley her governess and parry her treasurer a girl of fifteen 
it is not wonderful that she was pleased with a daring agreeable man who the year before had romped with her and caressed her now though he was twenty years her senior she gave him her first ready tender love having no competent adviser in all her princely household of one hundred and twenty servants and yielding to the persuasions of mrs ashley and parry she met her wily lover at various times and places by stealth yet she seems to have acted with remarkable prudence at these imprudent meetings as in all her communications with him she assured him that she would marry him if he gained the consent of the royal council over which seymour's brother the duke of somerset ruled with kingly power as protector during edward's minority but rumours of the secret courtship were already afloat the brothers seymour and somerset were both exceedingly ambitious and jealous of each other both aimed at royal authority and the former had got himself appointed lord admiral in the absence of the latter and had lately boasted of his concealed power. Seymour was soon arrested on the charge of high treason, and after the show of a trial was beheaded in the Tower of London. Parry and Mrs. Ashley had given evidence against him, but had exculpated Elizabeth. She herself was very strictly examined, but neither artful falsehoods nor terror could induce her to implicate any one. At so early an age, she was a match for the subtle persons who were sent to sound the depths of her heart. The tragical event made a powerful impression on her, and all things considered, it must have had an unfavourable effect on her character. The execution of her mother and her own first winning lover the disgrace heaped upon their memories and herself, the neglects shown her through all her youth, her friendless condition, and the appointment of a new and strict governess, must altogether have exasperated her strong and princely will, and embittered her feelings. The child, the youth, if not the after-tyrannical woman, has many claims to admiring sympathy. The common reports concerning her at this time were of the most scandalous sort. That she gave some occasion for misrepresentation was probable at her period of life, and is rendered plausible by the fact that Mrs. Ashley is known to have deceived the servant of Sir Henry Parker, sent to inquire into the facts, and that she and Parry were promoted to high offices by Queen Elizabeth during all her reign as if she would keep them silent on some points of the affair. At all events, the young princess displayed singular tact and talent in the whole course of it, and was schooled in such trials for the profound craftiness of her career. When Seymour's fate was announced to her, she betrayed no emotion to the spies who watched her features, and only said, this day died a man with much wit and very little judgment. End of section 22 23 of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part Two. Her effort henceforth was to recover that popularity which was the object of her lifelong pursuit. She became very grave and studious, and devoted herself, among other things, to the theological questions which were then generally agitated. To the learned William Grindle succeeded the learned Roger Ascombe as her tutor. He had before written to her governess in these curious words after the style of the time. Gentle Mrs. Ashley, 
would god my wit wist what words would express the thanks you have deserved of all true english hearts for that noble imp elizabeth by your labour and wisdom now flourishing in all goodly godliness now he undertook to perfect her in the classics as to her personal decoration at this time he writes in a latin letter to a friend that quote, she greatly prefers a simple elegance to show and splendour so despising the outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold that in the whole manner of her life she rather resembles hippolyta than phedra End quote. little did the good man imagine that at her death her wardrobe would contain three thousand costly dresses and eighty wigs of various colours her household expenses were already on a grand scale befitting the blood royal large sums were paid to musicians theatrical companies and for her servants velvet liveries and for her stock of choice wines prize oxen for her table and walnut furniture for her palace but she affected extreme simplicity of dress knowing that her youthful charms were best unadorned and desiring to ingratiate herself with a triumphant protestant party who opposed the claims of her sister mary a catholic on the sixth of july fifteen fifty three king edward died of consumption sixteen years of age elizabeth being twenty and mary thirty-six somerset had met the fate of his brother and had been superseded by dudley duke of northumberland who had persecuted mary on account of her faith and when edward's health failed and mary was likely to assume the sceptre was alarmed at the ruin ready to fall on his head he resolved both to save and further advance himself by a bold step the lady jane grey sixteen years old and of marvellous learning beauty and loveliness of character was like mary queen of scots a granddaughter of a sister of henry the eighth the father of mary elizabeth and edward by henry's will she was next heir to the crown after his own children dudley therefore effected a marriage between jane grey and a handsome promising son of his own then appealing to the religious convictions of the dying edward procured his legacy of the crown to her and concealed his death for a while in order to get the sisters into his power in this he failed but forthwith prevailed on jane grey against her will to be crowned she acted the part of queen but nine days dudley's forces did not rally in sufficient strength the nation apparently from a sturdy sense of honesty flocked to the standard of mary who soon entered london in triumph the duke with many adherents of the quasi queen suffered under the axe and three months afterward poor lady jane and her young husband met the same fate in that tower of london which still stands a mute and sullen witness to the heroic death of many noble victims elizabeth's conduct during these exciting events was marked by her rare caution and sagacity when deceitfully summoned to edward's bedside by dudley she remained at home being warned by friends perhaps and even feigned illness as it is asserted that she might not be mixed up with dudley's scheme while on the other hand mary was nearly entrapped before this sickness she gave the conspirators a shrewd and brave excuse for not signing away her title to the throne namely that she had none during the life of her elder sister her defenceless situation and the seeming success of lady jane's party evinced her courage in this and when mary victoriously advanced towards london 
Elizabeth forgot her illness, and hastened to meet and pay homage to her sister, with an armed retinue of two thousand horsemen, whose leaders were dressed in green, faced with velvet, satin, and taffeta. Learning that Mary had already dismissed her useless army, she next day met her with an unarmed cavalcade of a thousand persons, many of whom were ladies of rank. They were kindly received, and when the sisters entered the city they rode side by side on horseback, Mary's small, faded form and reserved demeanour poorly contrasting with the fresh youthfulness, tall, erect person, graceful airs and carefully shown delicate hands of Elizabeth, who then, as ever, craved applause and made the most of her attractions. Mary, though styled the bloody, was an unostentatious, sincere woman of excellent intentions. Her mixture of Spanish and Tudor blood gave her much latent pride and resolution, and she was embittered by her mother's and her own wrongs, but her heart was susceptible of the tenderest affection. She was generous to her sister under trying circumstances, and would have been humane in her administration, but for her intolerant creed, the sanguinary zeal of her advisers, the dangers of her position, and the spirit of the age. Unfortunately, differences soon sprang up between her and Elizabeth, and were fomented by the friends and ambition of each, or by the enemies of both. The younger sister was the hope and boast of the Protestant party, and for the sake of their plaudits as well as in consequence of her own education, she refused the Queen's summons to attend Romish Mass and resisted all her persuasions and threats, until, finding that she was endangering her safety and prospects, she sought an interview with Mary, threw herself at her feet, and expressed a willingness to be convinced of her errors, if they were such. In various ways she so pursued a double course that the Queen for a while gave her the place of highest honour on all occasions. In the grand pageant of the coronation, Elizabeth wore a French dress of white and silver tissue, and rode in a chariot drawn by six horses, trapped also with gold and silver, which followed immediately after the gold canopied litter in which the sovereign was born. But when Parliament passed an act which so affirmed the legitimacy of Mary as unavoidably to imply the contrary concerning herself, she resented it by an effort to withdraw from court. At this juncture the difficulties beset her which formed the third and greatest peril of her early career. Nothing but extraordinary care and good fortune saved her from the whirlpool of dangers into which she was now drawn. Her rash friends were her worst enemies. At the false instigation of her mortal foes they formed a plot, known as Wyatt's Rebellion, by which they hoped to enthrone Elizabeth, stop the Catholic schemes of Mary, and prevent her proposed marriage with Philip of Spain. Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, a prepossessing yet weak man, and kinsman of the sisters, had been rejected as suitor to Mary, and was now a leader in the plot, and resolved to gain Elizabeth. The King of France was busily seeking, by insincere offers of aid, to promote the conspiracy and inflame both parties in England against each other, in order that he might set his daughter-in-law, Mary of Scotland, another claimant, on the English throne. The Emperor Charles V of Spain was a still more deadly enemy of Elizabeth, because her pretensions endangered the plans for his son Philip, and because her mother had supplanted Catherine of Aragon in the days of King Henry. Thus was the future Virgin Queen beset by various powerful foes, 
and by mistaken supporters who vainly tried every means to involve her in the plot. Rumours of it reached Mary, who was persuaded to require Elizabeth's acceptance of the Prince of Piedmont, that the mouths of the Protestants might thus be shut in regard to her own alliance with Philip. The undaunted girl steadily resisted this, even in the face of not improbable death by the axe, for she was already accused and suspected, and her retirement from court, to avoid indignities and vexations, was construed against her loyalty. Letters from the rebels and the French to her were intercepted, and the odium of these unsought tamperings fell on her. The King of France offered her unlimited assistance, or, if she preferred, engaged to give her a refuge in his dominions, a refuge which would have proved a virtual imprisonment for life. At last the whole plot was disclosed to the royal council. In four days after, Wyatt, a knight in the southeastern part of England, raised the banner of revolt, and marched with four thousand men towards London. He was suffered to enter the city, and finding no expected aid, he was surrounded and yielded himself up in despair. The other leaders, in various parts of the kingdom, failed to support his movement, and were one after another arrested, among them Lady Jane Grey's father, who, in common with her and sixty of the conspirators, was speedily executed. It was a critical time for Elizabeth. The streets of London were hideous with heads of victims exposed to the populace, and the tower flowed with blood. She was summoned to the court to appear before avenging powers, and with the fate of her mother and many of her friends in vivid recollection. She delayed on the score of sickness, which, whether the result of agitation of mind or merely physical causes, was not feigned entirely, though doubtless she made the most of it in order to gain time. At length she was brought to the city. As she entered it, her lofty spirit rose superior to her bodily weakness and the terrific scenes around her. Gibbets were to be seen everywhere, and that morning the Lady Jane's father had perished, following to the block his lately sacrificed and lovely daughter. But Elizabeth ordered her litter to be uncovered, and gazed with scornful dignity on the crowd that pitied but dared not rescue her. She was dressed in white, emblematic of her innocence and a hundred gentlemen in velvet coats formed her guard of honour, followed by a hundred others in the royal livery of fine red cloth, faced with black velvet. Thus was she escorted to the palace of Whitehall, and there closely guarded. For three weeks her fate was discussed in the council, while she remained in torturing doubt of the result. There was every cowardly temptation for the traitors to criminate her in order to shield themselves, or recommend themselves to mercy. Wyatt did so, but, finding it of no avail to mitigate his sentence, confessed on the scaffold the falsity of his charges. The other prisoners, for the most part, acted with more honour than could have been anticipated. No positive evidence could be found against her, and the Queen, against the urgent advice of her chief statesman, firmly opposed the immolation of her sister on insufficient proof. But Queen Mary was to attend a meeting of Parliament at Oxford. She had to dispose of Elizabeth in some safe way, and so she ordered her to the Tower. This command was received with natural dismay. Elizabeth wrote an admirable letter to the Queen pleading against her supposed fate in strong, simple language, uttered with too much heartfelt anxiety to admit of her usual pedantic and finical amplification. She took care to occupy so much time in writing it that the tide of the Thames ebbed, and the barge that was to convey her 
could not pass the London Bridge. The next tide was at midnight, and it was not thought safe to attempt her removal at an hour when her friends might take advantage of the darkness to rescue her. On the morrow she was put aboard the boat. The tide not being fully up, she was nearly wrecked in the stream while passing the bridge. She reached the tower in a rainstorm, angrily dashed away an offered cloak, resisted the attempt to lead her through what was called the traitor's gate, and when she landed, exclaimed, Here lands as true a subject, being prisoner, as ever landed at these stairs. Before thee, O God, I speak it, having no other friend but thee alone. She seated herself on a stone in the pelting rain, and when urged not to endanger her health thus, she replied, Better sit here than in a worse place. She rebuked some of her attendants for weeping, and was conducted into her prison. The high-born captive remained two months in the tower. She and her servants were subjected to the severest examination by the council one member of her household being even put to torture to extract some evidence against her. It would appear that she had held some cautious conference with accomplices of the rebellion, perhaps that she might ascertain the designs of Jane Grey's party, who were engaged in the affair, professedly to favour Elizabeth. But Mary was too conscientious and faithful to the tender ties of blood to permit her prisoner's murder without good proof of treasonable intent. Moreover, at one of the examinations, Lord Arundel, one of her most influential and furious opposers, was suddenly convinced of the injustice done her. He nobly and impulsively expressed his sympathy, and Elizabeth, with her usual cunning and something of her subsequent coquetry, began to flatter him in such a way that he warmly espoused her cause, and henceforth began to entertain hopes that he might win her hand for himself or for his son. Still she suffered much rigorous usage. English prayers and Protestant forms were forbidden to her and her ladies, two of whom were taken away on account of their resistance to this tyranny. Her place of close confinement is said to have been directly beneath the alarm bell of the castle, so that her keepers might ring it readily to arouse the city in case of any attempt to deliver the princess. The handsome Courtney, for whom it is still supposed she had some liking, was incarcerated near her probably to tempt them to some communication which might be used against them. But her conduct is represented by her fellow prisoners as calm and brave. Whether it was to win favour or not, they spoke of her sweet words and sweeter deeds in consoling them. By degrees her privileges were increased. She bribed the Chamberlain to remit his officious interference with the provisions of her table by giving him a bountiful portion of them. Her health began to fail, and she was allowed to walk through a splendid suit of apartments known as the Queen's Lodgings, the tower being sometimes used as a refuge for royalty as well as a prison. In these walks she was accompanied by a guard and the windows were blinded that she might not look out. But her need of air procured her the liberty of a small garden within the walls. While pacing there, the captives were not permitted to gaze at her from their windows, lest some mutual understanding or plot might be contrived. Her constraint was relieved, however, by the winning acts of several children of the officers. These incidents are memorably beautiful. One infant girl brought her some little keys while she was in the garden, and told her that she need not stay there but might unlock the gates. Another child, a boy of four years, daily offered her flowers, and received trifling presents in return. This caused suspicion in the prying magnates of the place, who questioned the child, 
but could neither frighten nor coax him into any confession that he was employed to carry messages to and from the princess. He pitifully said to her through the keyhole of her door, Mistress, I can bring you no more flowers now. She was delighted with these little angels of consolation, and ever after seemed pleased with children for their sake. Among the many distinguished persons under arrest in the tower was Lord Robert Dudley, committed for aiding his father, Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, in the plot previous to the last mentioned one. He was born in the same hour with Elizabeth, had been a playfellow with her in her childhood, and was afterwards her chief favourite, and made by her the Earl of Leicester. He was on service abroad after leaving the tower, and until her accession to the throne, when he was immediately promoted and showered with favours. It is thought that he held a correspondence with her at the time of their imprisonment, by means of the boy who brought the flowers, inasmuch as they had no other opportunity of intercourse for a long time. Some hypothesis is apparently needed to explain her sudden partiality to one who had long opposed her interests. But their early companionship, his qualities, and her policy or susceptibility may account for it all. End of section 23twenty-four of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part Three. The climax of Elizabeth's danger soon came. It was a narrow escape from violent death, and illustrates the truth everywhere suggested by the pages of history, namely that the course of human events is daily changed or nearly changed by slight circumstances. The artful gardener, chief minister of state to Mary, had been gained over to the Spanish interest, and had persistently sought the princess's death. The Queen was taken ill, alarmed probably at his own fate if Elizabeth mounted the throne. He sent a Privy Council order to the Tower for her instant execution. The Lieutenant of the Tower observed that the Queen's signature was not appended to the warrant, and had the good sense to send a messenger to her, inquiring her will. Had he been more swayed by the influence of Gardiner, he might have thought the sovereign too ill to sign a document approved by her and legally drawn. Elizabeth might have perished, leaving a sadly romantic fame only second to Lady Jane Grey's, and Mary, Queen of Scots, might have sat on the English throne, carried out the designs of the English Mary, and further established popery in a land where no strong Scottish relish for endless secessions would have hindered the still papistic tendencies of a nation too aristocratic to care for other than a formal state religion. The Queen was aroused by this attempt on her sister's life. She sent Sir Henry Bedingfield, an honest and fearless man, with a hundred men of the Royal Guard, to take command of the Tower until she could transfer the princess to a safer place, far from the intrigues of court. She had already given up the idea of prosecuting her any further, and had begun to speak of her again by the endearing title of sister. She had refused, too, a Spanish proposal to send her to some continental court, an event that would have led to Elizabeth's ruin. At length it was resolved to remove her in the custody of Bedingfield to Woodstock, a royal residence fifty miles west of London. Elizabeth, apprehending that any hour might seal her fate, had been suddenly frightened at the first coming of Bedingfield, with his hundred men in blue uniform. As they rode into the castle she turned pale 
and hastily asked her attendants whether Lady Jane's scaffold had been taken away. When she learned that she was to be conducted to Woodstock, her terror took a new form. She inquired whether the knight were a person who made conscience of murder. She knew too well that prisoners who could not be legally executed were sometimes exposed on the highways to a concerted attack. But her fears were allayed by the reputation of her staunch new keeper. She went by boat to Richmond, near London. There the Queen was sojourning with her court, and with her she had an interview which resulted in nothing but a renewal of the former effort to induce Elizabeth to marry Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, and most intimate friend of Philip of Spain. As often before, she asserted her determination to remain single, and to intimidate her into the measure her servants were all taken from her. This deed again made her anxious for her life. This night I think I must die, she said. Her servants wept as they left her, as if they had looked upon her for the last time. But Lord Tame, one of her guards, assured her that he would protect her. When she was about to cross the Thames the next morning, her servants came to look another final farewell. "'Go to them,' she said to a gentleman, "'and tell them from me, tan quam ovis, like a sheep to the slaughter, for so am I led.' No one except her keepers was allowed to have the least communication with her. Noailles, the detestable French ambassador, who had all along laboured to destroy her, sent to her a present of apples on her way, a plan to cast upon her more of the odium of French friendship. The people of England, who were mostly Protestant and admired her, made sincerer demonstrations of sympathy. Wherever she passed, they crowded near and greeted her with prayers, acclamations and tears, though rudely thrust back and denounced as rebels by the soldiers. In some of the villages a joyful peal of bells announced her arrival, but Bedingfield, who was both her honest protector and suspicious master, silenced the bells and put the ringers in the stocks. The other guardian, Lord Tame, was bold enough to cheer her with a rich feast and invited company while the party rested at his country seat. He said, let what would befall, her grace should be merry in his house. So much chivalry and noble feeling existed even in those bloody days. At this entertainment she was not permitted to see the conclusion of a game of chess, lest some covert plan of delay were intended. And while continuing the journey, she was, for the same reason, forbidden to take shelter from a severe storm in a house by the wayside. At the palace of Woodstock she was uncomfortably lodged in the gatehouse and treated with much harshness. On her window she wrote these words with a diamond, Much suspected of me nothing proved can be, quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. On a shutter with a bit of charcoal, it is said that she inscribed these pathetic lines composed by herself. O oh, fortune, how thy restless, wavering state hath fraught with cares my troubled wit! Witness this present prison, whither fate could bear me, and the joys I quit. Thou caused the guilty to be loosed from bands wherein our innocence enclosed causing the guiltless to be straight reserved, and freeing those that death had well deserved. But by her envy can be nothing wrought, so God send to my foes all they have wrought. Quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. She composed elegant Latin verses to the same effect, and she wrote the following amusing yet excellent thoughts, on the fly-leaf of a copy of Paul's Epistles. Quote, 
August, I walk many times into the pleasant fields of the Holy Scriptures, where I pluck up the goodlysome herbs of sentences by pruning, eat them by reading, chew them by musing, and lay them up at length in the high seat of memory by gathering them together, that so having tasted their sweetness, I may less perceive the bitterness of this miserable life. End quote. One day, it is related, she saw through her window a milkmaid in the park, singing as she milked. She exclaimed, That milkmaid's lot is better than mine, and her life is merrier. Sixty soldiers were on guard round her apartments all day and night, and well were they needed. The infamous gardener sent one Basset, with twenty-five ruffians in disguise, to assassinate her. But so strict were the regulations of those who had her in custody, Bassett could get no access to his intended victim. An incendiary also kindled a fire directly beneath her room, but it was discovered in time to extinguish it. The fears and hopes of wily politicians and the zeal of Catholic priests were arrayed against her. Her right to live was denounced from their pulpits. As a matter of policy, she outwardly conformed to the Romish rites, yet when questioned as to her belief in transubstantiation, the changing of bread and wine into the actual flesh and blood of Christ at the Catholic communion, she made a famous reply in extempore rhymes to which no person could object, of course. Christ was the word that spake it, he took the bread and brake it, and what his word did make it, that I believe and take it. While she was thus inditing poetry at Woodstock, or suffering severe illness, or reading and meditating in resignation, weariness, or bitterness, as she paced her room and the adjacent garden, a change of feeling was taking place in regard to her. After a year of married life, Queen Mary was disappointed in her hope of an heir, and therefore looked still more kindly to her sister as her successor. And Mary's husband, Philip of Spain, fearing the claims of the Queen of Scots, hating France, desirous to gratify the English people, and perhaps with an eye to Elizabeth's hand himself, as he indeed sought it after the death of the Queen, who was now in declining health. With such motives, he urged his wife to invite the captive princess to pass Christmas at court in London. Arrived at Hampton Palace, she was still kept in close ward and repeated attempts were made to induce her to confess some kind of guilt, in order that she might not seem to have been imprisoned without just cause. On this condition she was promised full liberty. But she heroically resisted this disgraceful proposal, saying, I had as lief be in prison with honesty as to be abroad, suspected of Her Majesty. That which I have said I will stand to. After a week's strict confinement, she was startled by a summons at ten o'clock at night to appear before the Queen. This was at least the fifth time in her captivity when immediate preparations seemed to be making for her death. She begged her attendants to quote, pray for her, for she could not tell whether she would ever see them again. End quote, and was conducted by the light of torches to the Queen's apartment. Philip, ashamed to confront a woman at whose destruction he and his country had so long aimed, is said to have been concealed behind the tapestry of the room. A long conversation followed in English and Spanish, resulting in a fair understanding between the sisters. Elizabeth received a ring in pledge of amity and soon after was honoured as next in station to the Queen at the showy festivities of the holidays. She sat at the Queen's table, 
and were served by her late enemy, Lord Paget. Her brave and amiable suitor, Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, was present, but she avoided his attentions, having perhaps too much preference for Courtney or Dudley, and influenced doubtless by the wishes of her party, as well as by her own ambition to wield an undivided sceptre. With Philibert, who afterwards married a French princess, Margaret of Valois, she would have passed a happier life, but the event would have been a great disaster to England by hindering the free principles of the Reformation. Many other distinguished guests from various courts of Europe were gathered at this time to attend a grand tournament, which was to have taken place the year before in honour of Mary's marriage, but for some reason was delayed. Elizabeth sat beneath the royal canopy to witness the jousting, in which two hundred lances were shivered, the knights of Spain and Flanders entering the lists in their national costumes. At the services in the royal chapel, she was dressed in robe of rich white satin, parsimented all over with large pearls. Her appearance is described by the Venetian ambassador in this language, quote, Milady Elizabeth is a lady of great elegance, both of body and mind, though her face may be called pleasing rather than beautiful. She is tall and well made her complexion fine, though rather sallow. Her eyes, but above all her hands, which she takes care not to conceal, are of superior beauty. She is proud and dignified in manners." End quote. Great respect was shown her by the greatest dignitaries of the realm at this time. King and Cardinal, when they met her, sank on one knee and kissed her hand. She was very gracious to Philip, and afterwards boasted of him as one of her conquests. She returned to Woodstock. Her servants were allowed to accompany her, and she lived in comparative freedom. Some difficulty indeed arose concerning an astrologer, John Dee, whom she entertained on account of the strange interest which a woman of her education took in his occult science. Persons in her household were accused of practising by enchantment against the Queen's life. Elizabeth was brought back to Hampton Palace, but Philip so befriended her that she was finally suffered to return to her own chosen home, Hatfield House, where she was molested no further than by having one spy under her roof. This was Sir Thomas Pope, a learned and agreeable man, who was recommended by the Queen as a person who would look after her comfort, a pleasant way of installing him as her guardian. Quote, the fetters in which he held her were more like flowery wreaths thrown around her to attach her to a bower of royal pleasance than aught which might remind her of stern restraints, End quote. and she was well satisfied with the arrangement. Sir Thomas interested her in his plans concerning Trinity College, which he had just founded at Oxford. In return for her goodness, he assisted in the amusements at Hatfield House. One of these scenes is thus described by a chronicler of the time. Quote, at Shrovetide, Sir Thomas Pope made for the Lady Elizabeth, all at his own cost, a grand and rich masking in the Great Hall at Hatfield, where the pageants were marvellously furnished. There were twelve minstrels antiquely disguised, with forty-six or more gentlemen or ladies, many knights, nobles, and ladies of honour, apparelled in crimson satin, embroidered with wreaths of gold, and garnished with borders of hanging pearl. There was the device of a castle of cloth of gold, set with pomegranates about the battlements, with shields of knights hanging therefrom, and six knights in rich harness tourneyed. At night the cupboard in the hall was of twelve stages, mainly furnished with garnish of gold and silver vessels, and a banquet of seventy dishes, 
and, after a void of spices and subtleties, with thirty spice-plates, all at the charge of Sir Thomas Pope, and the next day the play of Holofernes. But the Queen, per case, misliked these follies, and so these disguisings ceased. End quote. Another scene is recorded. Quote, she was escorted from Hatfield to Enfield Chase by a retinue of twelve ladies clothed in white satin on ambling palfreys, and twenty yeomen in green, all on horseback, that her grace might hunt the hart. At entering the chase or forest, she was met by fifty archers in scarlet boots and yellow caps, armed with gilded bows, one of whom presented her a silver-headed arrow, winged with peacock's feathers. Sir Thomas Pope had the devising of this show. At the close of the sport, her grace was gratified with the privilege of cutting the buck's throat. End quote. When the Queen visited her, quote, she adorned her great state chamber for Her Majesty's reception with a sumptuous suit of tapestry, representing the siege of Antioch. After supper, a play was performed by the choir boys of St. Paul's. When it was over, one of the children sang, and was accompanied on the virginals by no meaner musician than the Princess Elizabeth herself. End quote. Such were the merry-makings in the olden time. At Hatfield her grace enjoyed again the services of Mrs. Ashley and Parry, who were so convenient to her in her first love affair. Roger Ascombe, too, resumed his place as her instructor, though she was now twenty-three years old, and so versed in the classics that Ascombe confesses he could teach her nothing more but rather her, quote, modest and maidenly looks taught him, end quote. A modesty that her Italian master calls, quote, a marvellous meek stomach, end quote. Her meekness must have undergone a sudden and astonishing change before she became queen. The language of these men is merely the ordinary flattery of those promoted to places near princes, or it shows a finished artfulness in the future mistress of all deception. At this time, the Archduke of Austria was expected at London to propose for her hand. There was no end of the matches arranged for her from her infancy until long after her coronation. The great Gustavus Vasa of Sweden offered his son, but the union was declined. The subject of Philibert's addresses was repeatedly introduced, and always with resulting ill will. At last, quote, he was seen making love from his window to the fair Duchess of Lorraine, end quote, and this discovery by Elizabeth herself, as well as the final resolution of the Queen, terminated the vexatious suit. The urgent renewal of it immediately after the death of Courtney is thought to argue a private engagement between him and the princess. How far her heart was tried with disappointment, and how far this led to her maiden resolutions, can never be known. End of section 24 Five of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part Four. In various ways her peace was constantly disturbed and her temper injured. In 1556, two insurrections broke out, headed by adventurous aspirants for her hand and a share in her expected sovereignty. The first was that of Sir Henry Dudley. Two of her officers were implicated in it, and she narrowly escaped suffering by their treason. 
the next revolt a few weeks after was raised by an impostor and proclaimed elizabeth queen and himself king as her husband from another danger she escaped only through the honesty of the new french ambassador wearied out with court intrigues respecting her she twice applied to him to secure her safe passage to france at last he plainly told her that if she ever hoped to ascend the throne she must never leave england but the queen was prostrate with mortal sickness in november fifteen fifty eight and elizabeth's anxieties for herself were soon to cease mary bequeathed her crown to her and secured some kind of promise that she would maintain the catholic religion in fact she observed the ceremonies of that church for a month after her sister's death when she found that the protestants were certainly in the majority mary sent her the crown jewels and philip added a precious casket in gratitude for such favours elizabeth always retained his portrait in her bedchamber as the queen failed in strength the courtiers as usual at such times forsook their late mistress and crowded around the expectant successor to the crown yet so cautious was elizabeth that she would assume no airs of royalty until she was certified of the queen's death by private means she engaged sir nicholas throckmorton to procure her majesty's black enamelled ring which she always wore as a bridal one so soon as she ceased to breathe and ride with it to her at his utmost speed this he commemorates in verse she said since naught exceedeth woman's fears who still dread some baits of subtlety sir nicholas know a ring my sister wears enamelled black a pledge of loyalty the which the king of spain in spousals gave if aught fall out amiss tis that i crave when the news came she knelt and repeated in latin the sacred words it is the lord's doing it is marvellous in our eyes this was afterwards engraved on her gold plate and another text i have chosen god for my helper was written likewise in latin on her silver service on the seventeenth day of november fifteen fifty eight mary expired and elizabeth was proclaimed queen great trouble was anticipated in consequence of the distracted state of religious parties and the late bloody persecutions by the papists but it all passed off peaceably the catholic lord chancellor nobly secured the recognition of elizabeth by parliament the people worn out with tyranny and terrified by a pestilence that swept the kingdom and strangely attacked many high ecclesiastics hailed the new sovereign with joy the bells were pealed bonfires lighted and the poor were publicly feasted by the rich queen elizabeth appointed cecil her secretary of state and retained him so long as he lived and his course proved the true policy of her choice in a few days she took her journey to london followed by a splendid procession of nobility and multitudes of the people who had often before enthusiastically crowded to see and hail her to the people she ascribed her quiet succession to the sceptre on her way she met a company of bishops and offered her hand to be kissed by each excepting bonner who had become notorious for his cruelty in persecuting nonconformists as she approached the city she rode in a costly chariot but entered the streets on horseback her dress was of purple velvet with a scarf over her shoulders and lord robert dudley her henceforth chief pet rode next to her before her were borne the sceptre and sword of state the walls of the city then existing were hung with tapestry and music everywhere resounded 
while the tower guns were continually discharged. At various points children were in waiting to welcome her with songs or set speeches. Nothing escaped her eye. She responded to everything, knowing well how far every attention goes in attaching the people to one in high station. It was always her rule to gain over all enemies and lose no friend. Reaching the tower, she went directly to the rooms where she had been imprisoned, fell on her knees, and thanked God, comparing herself to Daniel escaped from the lion's den. A few days after, she removed her court to Somerset Palace. Her first care was to ascertain by shrewd experiments how far she might restore the independent church and government of her father. After this, on the day preceding her coronation, she made a procession through the city. The Lord Mayor and his city companies, says a chronicler, met her on the Thames with their barges decked with banners of their crafts and mysteries. His own company, the Mercers, had a bachelor's barge and an attendant foist, with artillery shooting off lustily as they went, with great and pleasant melody of instruments which played in a sweet and heavenly manner. Landing at the tower, she left it in a chariot covered with crimson velvet, and overshadowed with a canopy borne by knights. One who was in the procession records that, quote, The Queen, as she entered the city, was received by the people with prayers, welcomings, cries, and tender words, and all signs which argue an earnest love of subjects towards their sovereign. And the Queen, by holding up her hands and glad countenance to such as stood afar off, and most tender language to those that stood nigh her grace, showed herself no less thankful to receive the people's good will than they to offer it. End quote. Frequently she stopped her chariots to receive gifts of flowers from poor women in the concourse. At the upper end of Gracechurch Street, beneath a splendid arch, had been erected a stage in three stories. On the lowest platform were effigies of the Queen's grandparents. Elizabeth of York, in the midst of a gigantic artificial white rose, at her side was Henry the Seventh, peeping from a mammoth red rose and holding his consort by the hand. From these roses a stem reached to the next higher stage, where the Queen's father was represented in the centre of a grand red and white rose, and holding Anne Boleyn by the hand. Another branch proceeded from this to the highest platform, where Elizabeth herself was counterfeited on a throne. Thus was her genealogy, embracing the houses of York and Lancaster, very ingeniously set forth and thus was Anne Boleyn at length honoured. Many other devices, such as Father Time, the Beatitudes, Deborah, etc., were to be seen. Through all this remarkable display, the Maiden Queen acted her part with consummate address, according to the taste of the period. In later times it would have been regarded as ludicrously theatrical, when she held up hands and eyes to heaven while certain speeches and songs were recited to her. At her coronation the next day, she was duly attired with crimson velvet, ermine, and buttons, cords, and tassels of gold. The usual elaborate ceremonies were observed, much to the edification of all concerned, if we accept the anointing with oil which Her Majesty so much disliked that she retired to change her dress, remarking to her maids that the oil was grease and smelled ill. At the banquet in Westminster Hall, which concluded the drama, the customary champion rode into the room in complete armour, and offered to defend against all gainsayers the, quote, most high and mighty princess, our dread sovereign Lady Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France, Ireland, defender of the true, ancient, and Catholic faith, 
most worthy empress from the Orcade Isles to the mountains Pyrenees. End quote. Here ends the truly heroical period of Elizabeth's life. She was now twenty-five years of age, had bravely and discreetly held her course through a sea of early troubles, and was so firmly established on the throne that the occasional plots of malcontents could not seriously affect her safety. Her long career was one of eminent worldly wisdom, but a wisdom that was confined to her personal interests, and did not, like that of Maria Theresa or Isabella of Spain, embrace the national welfare. The unprecedented prosperity of England during her reign was due to the peace which she selfishly maintained, and to other causes than her conduct. Her deceitful and cruel course towards Mary, Queen of Scots, belongs properly to the history of the latter. It was prompted by well-grounded fears, but carried to the pitch of despicable jealousy and unscrupulous malignity. This and the other leading events of Elizabeth's administration, unlike her youthful life, are too well known to require a detailed recital. As a rare picture of good Queen Bess in her thirty-first year, we have the account of a conference with her enjoyed by Melville, a Scottish ambassador. The morning after his arrival in London, he was admitted to an audience by Elizabeth, whom he found pacing an alley in her garden. The business upon which he came being arranged satisfactorily, Melville was favourably and familiarly treated by the English Queen. He remained at her court nearly a fortnight, and conversed with Her Majesty every day, sometimes thrice on the same day. Sir James, who was a shrewd observer, had thus an opportunity of remarking the many weaknesses and vanities which characterised Elizabeth. In allusion to her extreme love of power, he ventured to say to her, when she informed him she never intended to marry, Madam, you need not tell me that. I know your stately stomach. You think if you were married you would be but Queen of England, and now you are King and Queen both. You may not suffer a commander. Elizabeth was fortunately not offended at this freedom. She took Sir James upon one occasion into her bedchamber, and opened a little case in which were several miniature pictures. The pretense was to show him a likeness of Mary, but her real object was that he should observe in her possession a miniature of her favourite, the Earl of Leicester, upon which she had written with her own hand, My Lord's Picture. When Melville made this discovery, Elizabeth affected a little amiable confusion. I held the candle, says Sir James, and pressed to see my lord's picture, albeit she was loath to let me see it. At length I by importunity obtained sight thereof, and asked the same to carry home to the Queen, which she refused, alleging that she had but that one of his. At another time Elizabeth talked with Sir James of the different costumes of different countries. She told him she had dresses of many sorts, and she appeared in a new one every day during his continuance at court. Sometimes she was dressed after the English, sometimes after the French, and sometimes after the Italian fashion. She asked Sir James which he thought became her best. He said the Italian, quote, Wilk pleased her wheel, for she delighted to show her golden-coloured hair, wearing a kell and bonnet as they do in Italy. Her hair was redder than yellow, and apparently of nature, end quote. Elizabeth herself seems to have been quite contented with its hue, for she very complacently asked Sir James whether she or Mary had the finer hair. Sir James, having replied as politely as possible, she proceeded to inquire which he considered the more beautiful. The ambassador quaintly answered that the beauty of either was not her worst fault. 
this evasion would not serve, though Melville, for many sufficient reasons, was unwilling to say anything more definite. He told her that she was the fairest queen in England, and Mary the fairest in Scotland. Still, this was not enough. Sir James ventured, therefore, one step further. They were both, he said, the fairest ladies of their courts, and that the Queen of England was whiter, but our Queen was very lussom. Elizabeth next asked which of them was of highest stature. Sir James told her the Queen of Scots. Then she said the Queen was over high, and that herself was neither over high nor over lay. Then she asked it what kind of exercises she used. I said that as I was dispatched out of Scotland, the Queen was but new come back from the Highland hunting, and that when she had leisure frae the affairs of her country, she read upon good books the histories of divers countries, and sometimes would play upon the lute and virginals. She spirit gin she played weel, I said, reasonably for a queen. End quote. This account of Mary's accomplishments piqued Elizabeth's vanity, and determined her to give Melville some display of her own. Accordingly, next day one of the lords in waiting took him to a quiet gallery, where, as if by chance, he might hear the Queen play upon the virginals. After listening a little, Melville perceived well enough that he might take the liberty of entering the chamber whence the music came. Elizabeth coquettishly left off as soon as she saw him, and coming forward, tapped him with her hand, and affected to feel ashamed of being caught, declaring that she never played before company, but only when alone, to keep off melancholy. Melville made her a flattering speech, protesting that the music he had heard was of so exquisite a kind that it had irresistibly drawn him into the room. Elizabeth, who does not seem to have thought, as people are usually supposed to do in polite society, that comparisons are odious, could not rest satisfied without putting, as usual, the question whether Mary or she played best. Melville gave the English Queen the palm. Being now in good humour, she resolved that Sir James should have a specimen of her learning, which it was well known degenerated too much into pedantry. She praised his French, asking if he could also speak Italian, which she said she herself spoke reasonably well. She spoke to him also in Dutch, but Sir James says it was not good. Afterward she insisted upon his seeing her dance, and when her performance was over, she put the old question whether she or Mary danced best. Melville answered, The Queen danced it not so high and disposably as she did. Melville returned to Scotland, quote, convinced in his judgment that in Elizabeth's conduct there was neither plain dealing nor upright meaning, but great dissimulation, emulation, and fear that Mary's princely qualities should too soon chase her out and displace her from the kingdom. End quote. Surely such exquisite vanity as this description reveals could hardly belong to a mind of such breadth and power, whatever cunning it may have possessed. The great events of Elizabeth's reign were the establishment of Protestantism and the war with Spain signalized by the defeat of the invincible armada. The motives of her renunciation of the Pope's authority have been mentioned. She displayed the most admirable prudence in effecting a peaceable revolution of the national religion, and the beneficial consequences of it to the world cannot be overestimated. England and Scotland were, for a long time, the sole champions of religious reform among the nations, and nobly did they maintain their cause. Whatever were the faults and the springs of action of those who governed these two countries during this most critical period of the Church, 
a great debt of gratitude is for ever due to their firmness and intrepidity. End of section 25 twenty six of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruth golding the heroines of history by john s jenkins elizabeth of england part five the ecclesiastical position of England was the cause of the Spanish War. The great powers of the continent, temporal and spiritual, were leagued to crush everywhere the interests of truth and freedom, much in the way they are combined at this day. But the English aid rendered to Holland and Belgium against Philip, and the piracies committed on Spanish commerce by English vessels, were the occasions, if not the causes, of the war. The renowned Sir Francis Drake, the first circumnavigator of the world, had passed around Cape Horn, loaded his ships with gold and silver taken from the Spanish trading vessels, and finding his return intercepted, came home by way of India and the Cape of Good Hope. The Queen took possession of his plunder, on pretence that Philip might demand restitution. She disowned the expedition, but she welcomed the adventurer back, visited his ship, attended the festivities on board, and knighted the legalized buccaneer. When Philip, in 1587, was preparing his gigantic naval invasion of England, Drake, with a fleet of some thirty vessels, sailed for Spain, boldly forced his way into the harbour of Cadiz, and destroyed more than a hundred ships of the proposed expedition. Continuing his search, he burned or scuttled all the vessels he could find along the Spanish coast. This aroused the indomitable Philip to still greater exertions, and by the next year he had prepared his armada of 130 ships of unprecedented size, and carrying 30,000 men, together with 2,630 large pieces of brass cannon. Great was the terror of England at this vast armament, and great were the preparations made to resist it. Every rank of the people, high and low, throughout the kingdom, contributed its share of men, money, and ships. For months it was all enthusiasm, fear, and busy work. Thirty-four thousand foot and two thousand horse, with a considerable fleet, were in waiting on the coast to meet the enemy, while twenty-two thousand foot and a thousand horse, under the command of Leicester, were stationed near the mouth of the Thames to protect the capital. The Queen was undaunted in courage and untiring in activity through all this season of dreadful suspense. She was the animating soul of the whole defensive movement, and so great was her excitement that she suddenly knighted a lady who exhibited great spirit in encouraging her warlike plans. Herself generalissimo of all the forces, she was determined to lead them in the contest, or seemed to be resolved so to do, and was with difficulty dissuaded from endangering her person. As it was, she reviewed the troops at Leicester's camp, mounted on a fine horse, and attended only by two earls, one of whom carried the sword of state, while a page followed bearing her helmet with a white plume. A bright steel corslet covered her breast, immensely distended robes, as in her portraits, encumbered her person, and she held a marshal's truncheon in her hand. She was received with deafening applause, and made a spirited speech, in which she said, I am come among you, as you see at this time, not for recreation and disport, 
but being resolved in the midst of the heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdoms and for my people, my honour and my blood even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonour should grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. Rapturous shouts and professions of fidelity followed this appeal. A storm scattered the armada for a while at the outset. This was reported as its entire loss, and Elizabeth ordered her larger vessels to be dismantled, so quickly did parsimony succeed her boastful self-denial. Her admiral ventured to retain all his force on the strength of his private purse, and thus saved England. On the 19th of July, 1588, the tall Spanish ships, with their lofty decks turreted like castles, were descried entering the channel and extending seven miles to the right and left in the form of a half-moon. Night sank upon the dusky beach and on the purple sea. Such night in England ne'er had been, nor e'er again shall be. From Ediston to Berwick Bounds, from Lyme to Milford Bay, that time of slumber was as bright and busy as the day. For swift to east and swift to west the warning radiance spread. High on St. Michael's Mount it shone, it shone on Beachy Head. Far on the deep the Spaniard saw along each southern shire, cape beyond cape, in endless range, those twinkling points of fire. The result is well known. The light English vessels hovered about the unwieldy ships of the Armada, crippling and sinking them. At night many were set on fire, all were thrown into confusion, and escaped towards the Orkney Isles, where a storm so overwhelmed them that not one half of the proud armament returned to Spain. The first half of Elizabeth's forty-five years' reign was much occupied with her flirtations. She had innumerable lovers who longed to share her power. Her position, next to that of the King of Spain, was the most splendid of any sovereign, and many princes, both at home and abroad, burned for the prize of her hand. She seems to have been too politic to hazard her popularity among her subjects by wedding a foreign and therefore Catholic suitor, and too ambitious to accept of any subject of her own. But she had vanity enough to dally with all who numbered themselves among her admirers. And once or twice the advantages of married life betrayed her into actual preparations for the nuptial ceremony. She professed, however, a desire to remain single. When the House of Commons ventured to suggest the desirability of an heir to the throne, she replied that she would be content to have her tombstone declare that here lies one who lived and died a maiden queen. Philip proposed to her through his messenger immediately on the death of his wife. Two years afterwards she had the smallpox. The kingdom was alarmed at the prospect of her death, and the confusion that might follow concerning her successor, and Parliament again recommended marriage to her on her recovery. There seemed to be some prospect now of her union with Robert Dudley, whom she had made Earl of Leicester, and had chiefly favoured. He was suspected to have murdered his wife to make room for such an event, and Elizabeth had thrown out a remark that appeared to justify such an expectation. 
In her frequent and magnificent excursions he enjoyed her manifest partiality. Once she visited his seat, the castle of Kenilworth, which was a gift from her. The earl, we are told, made the most extensive and costly arrangements for the reception and entertainment of the queen and her retinue on this occasion. The moat of the castle had a floating island upon it, with a fictitious personage whom they called the Lady of the Lake upon the island, who sung a song in praise of Elizabeth as she passed the bridge. There was also an artificial dolphin swimming upon the water, with a band of musicians within it. As the Queen advanced across the park, men and women in strange disguises came out to meet her, and to offer her salutations and praises. One was dressed as a Sibyl, another like an American savage, and a third who was concealed represented an echo. This visit continued for nineteen days, and the stories of the splendid entertainments provided for the company, the plays, the bear-baitings, the fireworks, the huntings, the mock fights, the feastings and revelries, filled all Europe at the time and have been celebrated by historians and story-tellers ever since. But Leicester's flatteries were all in vain. In despair he married another. The Queen, as usual in such circumstances, was enraged, and sent him to prison, but afterwards released him. So unwilling is poor human nature to yield an inch of the territory it has acquired in other hearts, that many a person, though like Elizabeth, a Minerva in wisdom, and, unlike her, an angel of goodness, will yet indignantly regard the one as faithless and fickle, who, doomed for an indefinite period to be fried on the coals of hopeless anxiety, at last turns to another and more heroic spirit to find sympathy. With the Virgin Queen, it was a settled system to prevent all love-matches that seemed to promise happiness to those who meditated them, and also to separate and imprison for years or for life those who married without her knowledge or consent. Standing irresolute at the half-open door of matrimony, she would neither enter herself nor suffer others to go in thereat. The many outrageous instances of her envy and cruelty need not be repeated. A passage in the life of Sir Walter Raleigh illustrates the tyranny of Elizabeth in affairs of the heart, and also her extreme susceptibility to the gross flatteries which she constantly craved and received. She was mad with resentment at his marriage, and sent him to the tower. He straightway affected to be overcome with wretchedness at his separation not from his beautiful bride, but from the Queen herself. As Her Majesty sailed by on the Thames, he counterfeited a crazy determination to leap from the window and swim out to the royal barge, being only prevented by his keeper, whose wig he tore off and whose heart he pretended he would strike through with his dagger in the struggle. He then wrote to Cecil, knowing that the letter would be shown to the Queen. Of her he thus spoke, How can I live alone in prison, while she is afar off, I, who was wont to behold her riding like Alexander, hunting like Diana, walking like Venus? the gentle wind blowing her fair hair about her pure cheeks like a nymph, sometimes sitting in the shade like a goddess, sometimes playing on the lute like Orpheus. But once a miss hath bereaved me of all, all those times are past, the loves, the sighs, the sorrows, the desires, can they not weigh down one frail misfortune? Elizabeth was so affected by this tender description of herself 
that she released him not long after. Her suitors gradually fell off as she approached an unfruitful age, until in her forty-sixth year Francis, Duke of Anjou, and brother of the French king, was almost the only one that remained. He was not half her equal in years, and had never seen her. He plied his courtship through an artful proxy, and the ancient maiden so warmed towards him that he made a pompous visit to the English court. The affair was fully arranged, and at a banquet the queen publicly put a ring on his finger in token of the engagement. The event created a great sensation on the fast-anchored isle, and throughout the continent, where it was signalized with bells and bonfires. But as the marriage approached, Elizabeth wavered. She summoned Francis to her presence, and when he had left her apartment, he dashed away the ring and cursed the caprice of woman. She accompanied him with much parade to the coast, and entreated him to return, but he never showed his face again that side of the channel. Her last favourite was Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, by which name he is generally known. He was a son of Leicester's second wife, and was a fascinating, fiery, generous young man, just of age, when Elizabeth, nearly sixty, transferred to him her partiality for Leicester, who had died soon after the defeat of the Armada. Her regard for Essex appeared to be a mixture of motherly fondness and maidenly romance. She felt a torturing solicitude for his safety, and was frequently agonized by his unannounced departure on cruising expeditions against the Spaniards, in which he leapt for joy at every encounter, and plunged into the thickest fight. He gained a high place in general admiration, and with more discretion would have been the first man in the realm, but he overstepped the Queen's patience. Irritated by her refusal to grant a request of his, he committed the egregious offence of turning his back on her as he left her presence. She started up in a rage, and boxed him on the ear, and bade him go and be hanged. He seized his sword-hilt in a threatening way, and declared that he would not have taken that blow from King Henry her father, nor would he endure it from any one. They were afterwards reconciled, quarrelled again, and again were reconciled. But when the Queen withdrew the monopoly of wines from him, which was his chief support, he entered into treasonable plots was condemned and was executed, maintaining a brave spirit to the last. The Queen had formerly given him a ring, with the promise that it should be a guerdon of her favour if he ever fell into extreme disgrace and danger. She delayed his death for a long time, hoping that he would avail himself of the promise. He did, in fact, but the one to whom he entrusted the ring withheld it from Elizabeth. Subsequently this person, the Countess of Nottingham, confessed on a sick-bed her fault to the Queen, who shook the dying woman, and fiercely told her that God might forgive her, but she never would. These events induced in her a melancholy that hastened her death, which occurred in the seventieth year of her age, and the forty-fifth of her reign. She refused food and medicine, and lay prostrate on the floor at Richmond Palace, whither she had removed to be near a chapel that communicated with the royal apartments. For ten days and nights she lay in the anguish of remorse and bitterness, declaring that life was a burthen, and groaning at every breath. When urged to appoint a successor, she said angrily, I will have no rascal son in my seat, but one worthy to be a king, meaning thereby no one low in station, but the King of Scotland, the son of her hated rival, 
the Queen of Scots. At length she sank into a profound sleep, from which she never awoke. When she breathed no longer, the preconcerted sign of the fact, a sapphire ring, was dropped from her window into the hands of a messenger who started at full speed to convey it to James of Scotland. She was buried with magnificent ceremonies in Westminster Abbey. A wax figure of her, exhibited on the occasion, excited great lamentation, and is still preserved in a secret room of the Abbey. It has her delicate features, broad forehead, and high cheekbones and is dressed in her robes of crimson satin, profusely ornamented with pearls, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, fringe, and ample ruffs, with a purple velvet mantle, ermined and gold-laced. On the head is a light red frizzled wig, and on the small feet are high-heeled shoes, a fit emblem of her character. She was a learned, acute, brave and determined woman, but deceitful, jealous, vain, selfish, and malicious. Her life was a long progress from all that is promising and romantic to all that is pitiful and detestable, and her last years were a notable comment on the emptiness of pomp and power. In her reign the great stars of literature shone and England, from a second-rate kingdom, began the splendid career by which, at this hour, she boasts an eighth of the habitable globe, forty colonies, and a seventh of the world's population, or one hundred and eighty million subjects. End of section 26